Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Ann F. Baum Memorial Lecture on Elder Law. Ann Baum was born November 11, 1922. A lifelong resident of the Chicago area, Mrs. Baum grew up with seven siblings, and she and her husband, the late Alvin H. Baum, operated an investment firm in Chicago. The Baums were compassionate individuals who supported a broad array of charities, as well as provided direct support to needy individuals. Targets of their giving, including the disadvantaged, the young, the elderly, religious organizations, educational organizations, and civic organizations. Their legacy of giving and sharing is continued through the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund, of which both Alvin and Ann were benefactors. In remembrance of her life, a gift through her estate endowed the Ann F. Baum Memorial Lecture on Elder Law. This lecture series seeks to promote the relevant and timely discussion of a broad range of issues relating to the intersection of public policy, the law, and the elderly, issues that were dear to Ann Baum. Against that background, we are delighted to have with us today Professor Robert Sitkoff to talk about revocable trusts and incapacity planning. Professor Sitkoff is the John L. Gray Professor of Law at Harvard University, and he is the youngest professor to receive an endowed faculty position in the history of Harvard Law School. His research focuses on economic and empirical analysis of trusts, estates, and fiduciary administration, and his work has been published in the Yale Law Journal, the Stanford Law Review, the Columbia Law Review, and the Journal of Law and Economics, among others. He also is the surviving co-author of Wills, Trusts, and Estates, the leading American course book on trusts and estates. Professor Sitkoff is a member of the American Law Institute, where he is part of the council, the institute's board of director, directors, and the council's program committee. An active participant in trusts and estates law reform, he serves as the Massachusetts gubernatorial appointment on the Uniform Law Commission. He also is the editor of the Wills, Trusts, and Estates Abstracting Journal for the Social Science Research Network, is a past chair of the section on trusts and estates of the Association of American Law Schools, and is an academic fellow of the American College of Trust and Estate Council. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Sitkoff. So uh, thank you. That's a very kind um, introduction. I I'm, I'm glad to be back here. You know, I just want to say, because people always, people like this uh, fact about the, uh, the chair, uh, the age and the chair. So I'll tell you the true story of what happened. Um, I, Elena Kagan was the dean at Harvard at the time, and uh, I was visiting when the faculty voted for my appointment. Uh, I was in my office during the faculty meeting, and then there was a knock at the door, and it was Elena, and so I opened the door, and she came in, gave me a hug, and I said, okay, well, then I guess the vote went well, and we were chatting, and as she got ready to leave, she said, oh, and by the way, if you say yes, you would be the John L. Gray uh, Professor of Law, and I said, wow, that's I was a little early in career for that, I'm, I'm really flattered. That's, uh, I just says, well, you know, it, the chair is restricted for a scholar in trust and estate, so what else am I going to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> I said, fair enough. So, so, so uh, I, let me, um, I, 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 uh, there is, uh, I, I have to say, uh, well, there are two things, I, uh, two or three things I can say in introduction. One, I'm required uh, by the rules of Harvard University to disclose to you before we begin that I participate in one or more outside activities that may relate to the subject matter of this talk, and there's a full disclosure on the uh, web page. So for the fiduciary lawyers in the room, what the story there is, um, we had a medical school professor who was going around the country telling people that you have to use whatever drug or treatment or whatever or everyone will die or something like that. And what he didn't disclose was that he owned the company that made this thing. <laughs> So it was really tarnished the brand and him, and it was kind of, kind of a bad thing. So anyway, we have these new disclosure uh, uh, So that's one thing I needed to say. Uh, the other is, uh, this is, I think, the fourth time I was here. Almost every time I've been here before was at the invitation of Larry Ribstein. I wasn't able to come to the Larry Ribstein Memorial a couple of years ago, but I just wanted to say that there are many of us in the fiduciary fields across the country who feel the diminishment of the loss of Larry. I know your community would feel it more acutely. 
But Larry helped and touched everybody who did fiduciary work. My first interaction with him was when I was a law clerk and I sent him a draft paper and he gave me all kinds of time and attention and ever since then. So for me, it's a little bittersweet to be here, but without Larry, for me, that's the first time. But I know that's something that you all do uh, every uh, day. So what are we going to do uh, today? I'm going to talk about revocable trust and incapacity planning. And I, I thought, and this was Dick Kaplan's suggestion, I might say a word about, so why do we have a trust in the states person here for the elder law uh, lecture? So the answer comes to us from uh, last night's episode of Better Call Saul, right? So I asked how many people here are Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad <laughs> fans? We have uh, some. So I, I flew in late last night, but uh, they, I had some time in the hotel this morning, so I went to the gym, and while I do my cardio I, on my iPad, I watched last night's episode in which he did a will and a trust for an older person and was talking to another lawyer and said, you know, you really ought to get into elder law. That's a real thing. This is kind of important that people have real uh, problems, and so it seems that this is – well, how did he get there? He got there from doing wills and trusts, and the uh, basic idea, the more – uh, important point is that uh, trust and estates lawyers are in many ways the clergy of legal profession. We are the life cycle lawyers. We are the people who you call when you get married and when you get uh, children and then get divorced and get remarried and have more children. And then when people get sick and people die, it's the trust and estates lawyer who is the interface between the legal practice and people, as the life cycle lawyers, we do prenuptial agreements, we do wills and trusts, and when we do your wills and trusts, we also plan for a capacity. We plan for a capacity meaning of your person and in dealing with your property management. This is part of trust and estates uh, practice, and it's something that the trust and estates field only intermittently uh, pays enough attention to. That's really the story of what I'm going to show you uh, today. So let me start off by giving you a, a kind of basic model of the trust, which is amazing. So we're going to talk for a minute about what the trust is, and then I want to situate it in a kind of conventional story, and then show you a historical development of the trust into the problem that we have uh, today. So let's start off with, uh, we have our friend, the uh, settlor. The settlor comes from the old term to settle a trust, a, a trust settlement. The settler wants to make a gift or a transfer to a, a group of beneficiaries. And there are many reasons why you might want to do that. It could be donative, it could be commercial, but for a variety of uh, possibilities, you may not want to give the property to these people outright. It could be a tax motivation. It could be that they're young or improvident or spendthrift or inborn, unborn. They might be in, uh, incapacitated. For a variety of reasons, you might not want to give the property to them outright. So instead of giving the property to them outright, we give this to the trustee, the person whom we will trust with the property. We give the property to the trustee, and the trustee promises in return to manage the property in the best interests of the beneficiary. So that's our diagram at the top there. The trustee's job then is to make distributions to the beneficiaries peri periodically in accordance with the terms of the trust and then existing circumstances subject to fiduciary enforcement rights of the beneficiaries. That's an important point to which I'll come back later. All right, so here's our basic model, our basic uh, triangular model of the trust. We have our three players. We have the settlor, who is the donor, the person giving the property, the trustee who holds and manages the property, and the beneficiaries for whose benefit we have set this up. All right, this is half of our uh, story. The other half of the uh, story, which makes the trust uh, so amazing, is this asset partitioning uh, side. So the trustee now has the trust property. The trust device wouldn't work all that well if we didn't divide the trustee in half as a functional matter so that the trustee has the trustee's own property in one bucket and has the trust assets in another bucket. Creditors of the trustee in the trustee's fiduciary capacity have recourse only against the trust bucket, and the trustee's personal creditors have recourse only against the trust bucket. This seems like a kind of intuitive point when we say it out loud, but it's enormously important. You can't make me your, the trustee of a trust for your wife and kids without examining my creditworthiness but for this rule. It's kind of an amazing uh, feature that the common law provides this asset partitioning without notice and a filing. It is the only way to get asset partitioning without a notice and a filing. Otherwise, you've got to go corporate or LLC or limited partnership. It is the only common law device that gets you asset partitioning in this uh, way. It's kind of an amazing development. So we have these three parties that allow for fiduciary administration of property for beneficiaries. The asset partitioning uh, makes this work. It's our basic model that's generally understood. I think there's a kind of intuitive understanding of this trust device. So let's situate the trust device within a conventional story with what people uh, know. 
So people think about trust, they think about trust in estates, they think about the dead person, to us the decedent. So in their kind of your imagination, we have a decedent, the decedent dies, and so the decedent goes into probate, which is scary, and goblins or whatever. So we go into probate. When you're in probate, you have two choices. Your property can go by intestate succession. Intestate means without a testate, without a will. Those are just default rules. What do we think the typical person would have wanted? Or you could have a will. Right? So this is our rough understanding of transfer at death. We have our decedent. Decedent goes into probate. Probate transfers either will go by uh, intestacy or will pass by will. And if, as we understand, we think about that a little more, we understand when it's by will, we could give property outright to the children or the University of Illinois or whatever, or you could create a trust. And that's where we are kind of our model of trust. The first approximation model of trust is, oh, right, we have a trustee and we've got beneficiaries. That's something I create when I die, and it's an alternative to giving the property to people outright. It's a kind of conventional basic understanding of our wealth transfer system and the role of the trust in our wealth transfer system. It's seriously incomplete, this basic understanding, in many ways, both doctrinal and functional. So what I want to do is I want to show you some of its incompleteness doctrinally, and then I want to show you its incompleteness functionally, and that then will bring us to the problem of planning for incapacity. So how is it incomplete uh, doctrinally? Well, we could think of a doctrinal typology of trusts. What we've been talking about are testamentary trusts. It's a trust that's created by a will. The will is the trust instrument. The type of transfer is a probate transfer. In other words, your will creates the trust. You're making a transfer. Oops. You're making a transfer uh, in a probate. And the trust is therefore irrevocable. It's irrevocable because you're dead, right? Testamentary trust should not be controversial. Testamentary trust, testamentary trust necessarily going to be irrevocable. And that's an important point that this has affected our thinking about trusts and our, under, and our law reform process, that our paradigmatic trust for many years, a testamentary trust necessarily uh, irrevocable. It's another way to create a trust, though, and that's to do it before you die. Inter vivos, during life. We can also create a trust during life. Inter vivos. How do you create a trust during life? Well, by a declaration of trust or a deed of trust. What is that? A deed of trust would be something like I took $10,000 and I said, I give you this $10,000 for the benefit of the University of Illinois to create a program in trust and estates. That would be a great idea. That would be a deed Right, that's a deed of trust. That's a conveyance of the property to a third party as trustee for benefit of others. That happens to be a charitable trust. It doesn't matter. For these purposes, a deed of trust, third party, a trustee. The other way to create a trust during life is by declaration of trust, and that is what it sounds like. I declare myself as trustee of this pen for my benefit for life, remainder to such of my descendants, and, and so on. It's a declaration of trust. A declaration of trust is where the settlor declares him or herself as trustee of the property. So let's just kind of understand conceptually a difficulty that people have with this. How has my relationship with this pen changed in any meaningful way after I've made that declaration of trust? Under an orthodox understanding, what has happened is I've transformed myself from the fee simple owner of this pen. I, could, I can act whimsically. I could throw it out. I can chew on it. I could do whatever I want with it into a fiduciary. Now I'm the holder of this property in a fiduciary capacity with duties to the beneficiaries, which include my descendants and others. This is a problem to which we'll recur. The, the problem of the declaration of trust and the awkwardness of saying I'm on, under a fiduciary obligation. It's awkward in particular because this could be a revocable trust. When you have an inter vivos trust, it doesn't have to be irrevocable. It could be revocable. And in fact, under modern law, we presume that an inter vivos trust is revocable. So let's go back to my pen example. I declare myself as trustee of this pen for my benefit for life. The awkwardness is that trust is revocable. What exactly could I do that would be a breach of my fiduciary duties that wouldn't in truth be an implied revocation of the trust? So it's an important distinction as we think about testamentary, which are necessarily irrevocable trusts, versus inter vivos trusts, which could be revocable or could be irrevocable. It's irrevocable. I don't think we have a problem understanding there's a fiduciary obligation there. I've given it up. 
There is no greater to include the lesser. But if I have it's an irrevocable trust, there's something different. There's something different going on. This is a problem that we're going to want to look at. So here's our uh, here's our um, our doctrinal typology, and uh, we can go back to this original picture. And now we can fill in a little more complexity to our wealth transfer system. We can bring in uh, non-probate modes of transfer. And now we have one non-probate mode of transfer, the IV trust, the inter vivos trust. Notice under testamentary trust, I've now put in brackets irrev, because that's necessarily an irrevocable trust. Our IV trust could be revocable or irrevocable. It could be revocable or irrevocable. They're both alternate means of uh, transfer of property by way of non-probate transfer. So what's nice about this picture is that it invites us to think a little bit more functionally than about trust. Instead of doctrinally, inter vivos trust versus um, testamentary trust, we might instead think a little bit more functionally about the differences between these trusts. And on a functional typology, what matters is not so much whether the trust happens to be on the right-hand side here or the left-hand side. What really matters is whether the trust is revocable. I'll say that again. What really matters for functional purposes is whether the trust is revocable. So let me show you, uh, let me give you a, a, a three-part typology for contemporary trust practice. We have irrevocable trusts. That's your model of the trust. That's the model of the trust that's in movies and in books that people kind of talk about. That's what we think about. That was our first example, the testamentary trust. That's the dominant understanding in popular imagination, even among many lawyers, of what a trust is. What is the irrevocable trust purpose? Its purpose is ongoing fiduciary administration of property up, down the uh, generations. So what we have in the in irrevocable trust practice, what John Langbein calls the management trust, is a kind of fiduciary industry where we have um, professional fiduciaries who manage the property down the generations uh, across time. So that's one category. That's the irrevocable trust. Doesn't matter that it, whether it's testamentary or inter vivos. What matters is that it's irrevocable. It's a fiduciary ongoing administration trust. But then we have revocable trusts. Revocable trusts are something different. Revocable trusts don't look like a fiduciary administration trust. Go back to my example of the pen, except let's not make it pen. Let's make it something less ridiculous. I declare myself as trustee of all of my wealth. I declare myself as trustee of Blackacre and this bank account and this and that and whatever for my benefit for life with a power to revoke, but if I don't revoke it before I die, then to one-third to my spouse and two-thirds to my children, da-da-da-da-da. That doesn't look like a trust so much as it looks like a will, right? Doesn't look, it's a revocable instrument that has, doesn't really have functional meaning until I die. It's kind of looking like a will. What I'm trying to suggest here is that the revocability, irrevocability distinction is important in assessing whether what we are doing is ongoing fiduciary administration on the one hand, or instead we're doing a will substitute we are doing a mode of transfer outside of, outside of uh, probate. So that's our revocable trust uh, branch. We have a third branch that nobody talks about, at least not in legal academy, which is business trusts. That would be important. Well, why would that be important? So how many people have heard of a mutual fund? You have heard of asset securitization? Remember we had a crisis in 2008? Okay. Uh, those would be business trusts. The preferred special purpose entity in asset securitization is the Delaware Statutory Trust. The preferred entity in organizing mutual funds are business trusts. So those are, you know, like trillions of dollars, but we don't talk about those in uh, law school. It's kind of the, the, what happens is the business lawyers think the trusts and states people do it, but we are organized around freedom of disposition. Business trusts are a freedom of contract thing, so that just needs to go over to somebody else, and then it goes nowhere. So we'll just get rid of that. We're back to our issues that we're going to talk about, which is the distinction, the freedom of disposition trusts, which are the difference between revocability and irrevocability. So let's go back to our picture here. Right? So here's our, our uh, picture. What I'm suggesting is that we want to think about uh, donor of transfer trusts as being one of two kinds. There's the revocable kind and irrevocable kind. I care less about whether irrevocable is on the testamentary side of the house or the inter vivo side of the house. What more matters to me is that it's irrevocable. So let's start with irrevocable. What's going on with irrevocable trusts? What's our story here? 
And this is important for when we get into revocable trusts. What's important here is the F word. It's fiduciary. That's, our, that's the governance story we're telling. So go back to our picture. Remember Settlor? Settlor wants to give property to the beneficiaries, but for some reason, for one reason or another, we don't want to give it to the beneficiaries outright. Could be tax planning, could be they're improvident, could be they're unborn, they're feckless, or whatever. Could become a combination. We want to give this property to them outright. So instead, we give it to the trustee. The trustee takes the property, manages it for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Here's the important point. The thing I've just circled, that's a simple outright transfer. Simple, low transaction cost, easy. The alternative here, trust, is complicated. There are four times as many lines <laughs> right on, on this than on the uh, left. This is complicated. You know, all this stuff on the right, it's my, my professional life's work. All this stuff, <laughs> all this stuff on the all this stuff on the right, that is a substitute for the simple transfer that's on the left. But it's a costly substitute. It's got all these lines. There's all this fiduciary. There's all this stuff going on. So there has to be a compensating benefit. Why do you incur all this cost without a compensation? Who would do this? Right? If we were at all sensible, why would you do this? You do this because you want the benefits of trusteeship. There must be some offsetting benefit to justify those costs. What are they? Well, one way to think of it are what are the functions of trusteeship? There's a custodial function, hold the property. There's an administrative function, you know, file the tax returns, keep the records, and so on. There's a distribution function, make distributions in accordance with the terms of the trust in light of then existing circumstances. And an investment function, manage the portfolio over time. In a gross sense, the advantage that the trust gives you is it allows you to interpose a fiduciary, a manager, between the beneficiaries and the property so someone else is doing this stuff. If you don't want the beneficiaries to handle custody, administration, investment, and distribution, you can have the fiduciary do this for them. Why might you want to do that? One way to think of this is uh, uh, the English scholar Bernard Rudin put it this way. A trust is a gift projected across the plane of time. So you know, I don't know what – if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, my kids are 9, 5, and 2. I don't know what they're going to look like in 5 years, 10 years, 30 years, 40 years, but – but my trustee, who's there and watches, will. And that trustee can make distributions in light of guidelines I provide as applied to then existing circumstances. The trustee can make investments in light of then existing market conditions and risk tolerance of the beneficiaries at that time. It's a way to postpone and delegate these decisions. You postpone them to be made in then existing circumstances. You delegate them to be made by the fiduciary. That's your offsetting benefit. Right? It's fiduciary administration. I'm emphasizing this because it's really hard to separate into, um, the story of the modern development of trust law from this fiduciary story. And that's how we get in the soup and in capacity planning. So we'll come to that in a moment. So that's our offsetting. That's our, our benefit. The cost is this complexity and the need for this fiduciary apparatus. So what does that uh, look like? So suppose we name our trustee, right? So here's our potential, <laughs> here's our potential, uh, here's our potential uh, trustee. So what might the, what could, you know, the trustee could be uh, loyal and fidelity to the settler's instruction and so on, but the trustee might also mismanage, misappropriate, abscond with the, with the money. So how do we keep this fiduciary uh, in uh, line? Well, you know, one possibility is you would give the beneficiaries a power to fire the trustee. We don't do that in trust law. We make it very hard, or at least traditionally make it harder to get rid of the trustee. Why? If the trustee works for the beneficiary, if the trustee can be fired by the beneficiaries, the trustee works for the beneficiaries. If the trustee works for the beneficiaries, it's going to look something like this. Distribute all the money or you're fired. It's not a gift projected across the plane of time anymore. It's a present gift at, you know, with this option right, to pull out at any time. Another way to put this is we have a tension in American trust law between, on the one hand, giving the beneficiaries enough say over the administration of the trust that they can safeguard their interests, while at the same time not giving them so much say that we discard the terms that the settlor provides. The settlor doesn't have to make the gift in the first place. 
right? This is an instrument for the settlor's freedom of disposition. So we, we, we take this off the table. We make it hard for the trust, the beneficiaries to fire the uh, trustee. We make it hard for the beneficiaries to sell their interest in the trust. So you think if I'm in a, if I invest in a company, I think the company's badly run. I could just sell my shares. We make it hard for the beneficiaries to sell their interest in a trust. We call it a spendthrift trust. Why would we do that? Because I don't want my beneficiaries to be able to alienate their interest. Yeah, that maybe means they lose out on some value maximizing transactions by not being able to alienate their interest. But you know what else it means? It means their creditors can't get it. Right? That's part of what I want out of the trust. I want the asset protection feature. I don't want the I want to make it inalienable. Inalienable, good for asset protection, bad for governance. There's no market for trust uh, control. I don't want to have incentive pay. I don't want to tell the trustee I'm going to give you a, a percentage on returns and so on. Likely, my beneficiaries are more risk averse than the trustee. I don't want a trustee with a portfolio of trusts to be chasing high returns for widows and orphans and the like. This is not an optimal contract arrangement. So we're left with the F word. You have to go F the trustee. You say fiduciary and you demand an accounting and impress constructive trust and all these wonderful equitable potential remedies. It's fiduciary, fiduciary. Our governance story is fiduciary. So benefit, administration over time, cost is we put some pressure on the fiduciary regime to uh, make this, uh, to make this uh, work for uh, us. Right, so that's our offsetting benefit for irrevocable trust practice, that we have a duty of loyalty, don't steal, don't be conflicted, a duty of prudence, act reasonably, and then we have all kinds of other fiduciary uh, duties that are elaborations of duties of prudence and loyalty given the, uh, the circumstances. So that's our, our story of the uh, management trust. What about that revocable trust? What's going on with the rev trust here, which is awkwardly fit in a fiduciary regime because it is revocable. To understand what's going on with the revocable trust, I want to fill in the rest of the, uh, I want to fill in the rest of the uh, story here. What's going on here is a story of probate avoidance. It's a story of will uh, substitute. What the, uh, what the probate avoidance, what a revocable trust allows me to do, when I declare myself as trustee of all of my property, when I die, that property is still held in the trust by whomever is the successor trustee. The successor trustee will make further distributions or continue to manage the trust in accordance with the terms of the trust. We just avoid probate. In a sense, it's a contracting around probate. So why might I do that? I may want to avoid probate because it could be slow, it could be expensive, it could be public. It could be that I've got assets in another state Right? Suppose if I live in Illinois, but I have a place on Lake Michigan in the state of Michigan, I don't want to have that real estate to go through probate in another state with added expenses. Maybe I put that property in trust. It allows for continuity in property management. Suppose I have a portfolio of liquid assets or otherwise a business that needs active day-to-day -day management. I don't want someone to have to go to court and get preliminary letters testamentary and then letters testamentary and fight the will contest. I want a fiduciary the moment I die to step in and have unbroken, continuous fiduciary administration of the uh, property. I also may want privacy, right? So what do I mean by uh, this? The, pro the will is a public document. So one of the fun things about the Duke Minier uh, casebook is that pictures of all these wills because they're in courts. You can get them. Rev trusts are private. Now, you know, I might like privacy. You know when I would really like privacy? If I have a billion dollars. And I don't want anybody to know what's going on with that. Or otherwise, I just might want privacy. I don't need anybody to be able to go into court and take a look at uh, these uh, things. Um, I may want to avoid ongoing court administration like I have in a probate. I have more leeway in choice of law. What does that mean? I live in Massachusetts. That's a state that has – oops. I live in Massachusetts. That's a state that has the rule against perpetuities. But for tax and other reasons, I might want a perpetual trust. So I might create the tr a rev trust, an IV trust while I'm alive in Illinois, which has no rule against perpetuities for trusts, or in Delaware or, and, and uh, the like. So all these are reasons why I might want to go in that direction. This is not just a rev trust story. So in the beginning, I said this original picture of trust was hopelessly too simple, both as a matter of doctrine as a matter, and as a matter of practice. Let's fill in the rest of practice. Rev trust is just one of several non-probate transfers. We also have JTWRS, Joint Tenancy with Right of Survivorship. 
So that would be many homes, for example, held in joint tenancy or in tenancy by the entirety. And then there are these POD and TOD things, pay on death arrangements and transfer on death arrangements. What are we talking about here? What's a pay on death arrangement? Life insurance is a nice example. It's a contract. I contract with MetLife. Under the terms of the contract, I'll give MetLife a certain number of dollars periodically. And then when I die, period, MetLife will make a payment. Let me just say a little thing about life insurance because it's important to me. So life insurance is not, of course, life insurance. It doesn't insure life. It's death insurance. You can't sell death insurance, so we sell it as life insurance. So if you're going to come away with anything from this talk, here's the point, particularly for students who are you know, you're making a massive investment in human capital. So the biggest estate planning mistake that people in their t 20s make and as they start getting into late 20s and 30s, starting about having a family, is not getting a lot of term life insurance before your blood work starts looking weird. <laughs> What's going to happen? As you start getting a little bit older, the metabolism will slow down and there will be a blood marker that's just weird and the doctor will say, yeah, well, that's just weird. Don't worry about it. But the insurance company, you're out of the, of the most favored group. So term life is super cheap. Super, super cheap because if you get a 30-year term policy when you're 30, that's, that means it covers you to your 60. Actuarially, you're not going to die before 60, so it's going to be very, very cheap for millions of insurance. But that's also the period of acute vulnerability when children are still young and need to go to school and, and spouse may not be able to work in those circumstances and so on. That's one huge mistake people make. The other one is not insuring a partner who works inside the home. That is incredibly expensive. Right? If you think about kind of a household production unit, right? So if you think of marriage as a long-term relational contract for horizontal integration of household production functions, <laughs> you can imagine my proposal. So it's, I see there'll be so much synergy here that we should have franchisees. So anyway, so three franchisees. Anyway, it's true. One of Two of them were puking on me yesterday. It was terrible. So anyway, the other is not insuring the, the partner who works inside. That's incredibly expensive. Like that contribution to household production is enormous. And the one who works outside the home is to cut that back. Okay, so back to the point. Life insurance. That's a pay-on-death contract, isn't it? That's I'll give you money. When I die, pay it to this person. You know what that is? It's a non-probate transfer. That's a non-probate kind of transfer. Then we also have uh, pension accounts. Pension accounts. This is the most important of all non-probate transfers in terms of dollars, and we can maybe say that another way. This may be the most important area of wealth accumulation and transfer, period. There are irresistible tax incentives to max out as much as you can on your, uh, on your pension plans. Modern pension plans today are no longer about securing your retirement. They are from middle class and above about tax-advantaged intergenerational savings, that you get this enormous tax advantage. You don't pay income tax on the property you put in. You defer that. It grows compounding without, uh, without uh, uh, tax. And then if you make withdrawals, you're no longer working. You're at a lower bracket. But if you don't make withdrawals, then you die. Then you, whoever you name, they come in and they take over that pension plan, and we reset it to their age. It's kind of an astonishing tax benefit. So the pen, as a, in consequence of this, Think about the tax side of it. In consequence of this, for kind of middle class and above, there's enormous savings in pension. Most wealth in middle class is actually in the pension plan. What does this mean? So it has a number of important consequences. One is it means that this is a huge non-probate transfer. Right? You have all the savings in your pension plan. It's a huge non-probate transfer. It's also problematic because the pension plan may have been created before you were married and before you had kids and you didn't know what paperwork you were filling out and you might have written down my brother, but meanwhile now you have a spouse and children. You didn't think to update it. Or you wrote down my spouse, A, but then you divorce A and you marry B and you forget to update it. It's a kind of huge, it's a kind of huge, often litigated, difficult planning problem. That's not our point here. Our point is just to say that there's a lot of money here, this non-probate transfer matters. Transfer on death accounts. You open up a bank or a brokerage account, there's going to be a little form there to say, is this, uh, is this okay? So there are three problems that come up in non-probate uh, succession. Three problems we want to talk about among all these will substitutes. One is, uh, how is this okay, right? How is this stuff valid? You know, we have these formal rules in law of wills. You have to have, you have to sign it at the foot, and you have to have witnesses, and 
there's a whole ordeal you have to go through to get this will vat. Why are these things okay? Why is it permissible to contract around probate? That's one problem. A second is, what do we do about all of our wills rules for these non-probate transfers? And then third, how do we clean up this mess we have made? So here's the mess again. Here's our modern wealth transfer system. It's kind of a no rational person would design this from the outset in this way. It's kind of a mess. So let's talk about each of these, and then we'll, and that gets us into planning for uh, incapacity. So one is, how are these things valid? The, here's Farkas, the Illinois case. This is the source of all of our problems in planning for capacity with Rev Trust. It all comes from Farkas. So how do we how do we get here? This famous famous case called Farkas, Illinois case. Here's what happened in Farkas. This guy named Farkas. He was a veterinarian. Doesn't matter. He he he, he had an assistant named uh, he had an assistant named Will, Williams. And he had a bunch of mutual funds. What he do is he declared himself as trustee of his interests in these mutual funds for his benefit for life. He reserved the right to all the income distributions. He reserved the right to sell it at any time. He reserved the right to revoke at any time. But if he didn't do any of those things, and if Williams survived him, then Williams gets the property when he dies. So that sounds like a will, right? He could sell it at any time. He can transfer any time. He gets all the benefits of it. He can revoke. And Williams only takes me if he, if he does. So it looks like a will. Question was... Is that valid? Because it didn't have wills formalities. It didn't follow our rules for making a, a valid uh, will. The court says, well, sure it's a valid because it's not a will. It's a trust. And how do I know it's a trust? Well, suppose Farkas just gave the property away to somebody else. Or suppose he you know, set on fire or did one of these things. Williams would have a suit against him for breach of trust for breach of fiduciary duty, says the court. And that means it's a real trust. And if it's a real trust, it doesn't have to, it's not a will. It's a different box. It's a trust box, not a will. But it's a will, has to have formalities. It's not a will, it doesn't need formalities because it has fiduciary enforcement. Now, you know, we could ask ourselves, is that really realistic that there's a fiduciary enforcement claim here? Another way to think about this is, what would the courts do if Williams brought that claim? What would Farkas's defense be? Wouldn't Farkas's defense be I re that's a revocation. <clears throat> In other words, what could Farkas what could Farkas possibly do that wouldn't better be understood as an implied revocation? If he has the power to do the most egregious of all breaches, put the money back in his pockets, how is that not a greater includes the lesser? I'm not saying the greater always includes the lesser, but this one seems like it should. This seems like it should be a greater includes the lesser. I, I, this is a fiction. It's a present interest fiction. It's the court saying Williams has a real interest in the trust. And because he has a real interest in the trust, it's a real trust. Real trust is not a will. It's not a will. It doesn't have wills act formalities. It's valid. The court wants this to be valid. It has to be valid because the non-probate system is happening. It's happening. We're here. It needs to be valid. There are a lot of formal substitute formalities kind of on a realist perspective. This is going to happen with or without you, court. So you're going to have to find a way to get there. The way the court found to get there was to find this fiduciary obligation. In time, we got rid of it. In time, we came to realize this fiduciary enforcement fiction is a fiction, and we could just give it up. And here's how that happened. First, the Farkas case, the suppose, actually happened. There's a case in New York and a case in Texas and a case in Florida, and slowly but surely the cases start happening. And when you actually had the case in front of you, no one wants to hold a settlor trustee liable for breach of trust when the person has the power to revoke the trust. It's kind of nonsensical. Think about what that opinion would look like. You know, so we say we're not going to do it. Finally, by 2000, we get the Uniform Trust Code, UTC. 603, while a trust is revocable, the duties of the trustee are owed exclusively to the settlor. If the settlor is also the trustee, because a declaration of trust means nothing, no duties, because anything you do, you've approved. You did it, right? So you're fine. This is a black letter. This gets it widely adopted with a modification we'll come to later. This is widely adopted. The restatement third says this. There are no modern cases in the last decade or so that go in the opposite direction. So this is the law in all the states, right? It's a law in all the states because either they've adopted this statute 
or they'll file the restatement third, or they have a case that's gone this way, or because they don't have law on it, but they're not going to be crazy. They're not, and they're going to buck this trend where everybody has gone the sensible. They're good functional. Now, today, we have good functional argument and a tonnage of precedent. Restatement, uniform law, and actual case law precedent. That's where we are. No more fiduciary obligation. So you might ask, well, then how come these things are valid? How can you have an, a, you know, this rev trust without formalities? Forget about it. You can because we're going to do it. We do it. We do it. That's it because we can. right? We wrote the rules. That's by fiat. That's it. We do it. So the will formalities, why we have them still is a discussion for another, uh, discussion for another time. Okay, the second problem is so now that we have these non-probate wills, which is what they are. We're not going to call them that, but that, that's their non-probate wills. What do we do about our probate infrastructure? So what do I mean by that? I'm talking about substantive restrictions on testation and um, rules of construction. So what do I mean by that? Another famous case is Sullivan against Birkin and Sullivan. Ernest took some real estate, put it in a trust, right? put it in a revocable trust for the benefit of Harold and George. Meanwhile, he's married. They're actually separated, but whatever. He's married. He dies. Wife shows up and says, I want my forced widow share. In this country, you can disinherit everybody and anybody except for your spouse to about a third, roughly speaking. So she says, I want my third. And not only do I want my third, but my third should include the property in the revocable trust. This is a good argument. If you're going to take the elective share seriously and say that this is kind of a partnership marital obligation, and we understand the rev trust is a will substitute, if the property had passed under his will, she'd have recourse to it. We can't, if he, she should have recourse if it passed under the Rev Trust. Otherwise, there's no elective share. Because if I want to screw my wife in Massachusetts, I'm from Massachusetts, I could just say, I declare my, uh, myself trustee over everything for the benefit of my paramour. And then there's nothing in my estate for, to, against which she could apply the elective share. So as a policy matter, conditional on having an elective share, this seems like it's got to be the right answer. And this is where the law has moved. By statute, by case, you know, in a herky-jerky way, we've moved in this direction in most uh, states. We do the same thing for creditor rights, right? So if uh, creditors have recourse against my property in probate, that's a major function in probate. What if I don't have any property in probate? We ought to give them recourse against my non-probate assets. It's messy because we don't have the organizing feature of probate, but that's where we move. What about rules of construction? Things like... Um, we have rules. What if I write a will? I leave everything to my wife, and then we get divorced. By operation of law, that's revoked. Suppose I have a life insurance policy for my wife or a rev trust. This is in a hugely litigated problematic area, right? All created by this fracturing, this, uh, fracturing, of, this fracturing of the program. But underlying this fracturing of the program is this, is this great functional insight that everything on this right-hand side here are just will substitutes. And there should be, they should be ambulatory, they should be freely changeable until death, there should be no fiduciary obligation until you die. That's a kind of truism in the trust and states world. It's accepted that there should be no duties, beneficiaries should have no rights. The beneficiaries are irrelevant on all this right-hand stuff because we apply the wills rule. Let me say that another way. For life insurance, for uh, brokerage accounts, for revocable trusts, modern view, beneficiaries have nothing until I die, just like a will. It's a kind of great victory of functional understanding in law reform. So we're happy, right? It's a great, this is kind of where the story ends for most trust and estates people. And this is happy and it's wonderful and it's terrific and so on. It's a small problem here. They're kind of, uh, there are kind of two problems here. One is we still have this mess. And the other is what about incapacity? So how do we deal with the mess? The way we deal with the mess, I'll show you here, is we just point everything at the Rev Trust. Right? So the way we deal with the trust today with the say is you say you make the trustee of your Rev Trust the beneficiary of all your non-probate transfers. And you make the, tr the trustee of your Rev Trust the beneficiary of all of your probate transfers. And now your Rev Trust has once has replaced the will as the centerpiece of estate planning. Right? This is an important step, not only because it allows us to unify uh, the estate planning, because, but bec also because it gives you the culture in the trust and estates world of what is the Rev Trust. The Rev Trust today is the new will. The Rev Trust today is the centerpiece. So you know your will, my will is about four, three pages. My Rev Trust is 40 pages because that's where all the tax junk and all that other kind of stuff 
and all the boilerplate for everything and everything and everything is in uh, there. And at, you point everything at the Rev Trust. Now I don't have to worry about I need to change the estate plan or you just you, everything's updated automatically by just doing the Rev Trust. So our vision of the Rev Trust is it is the will. It's the new will. There's no fiduciary obligation anymore, no formalities. It's kind of you know happy and fine. And so here's a kind of picture of a modern unified estate plan. What we have, I don't think this is, that's not going to point. What we have is you make the, you point, pour just everything into the Rev Trust. So here's where the story ends in a typical trust and estates kind of world. Now let's layer on our incapacity. Let's layer on our uh, incapacity a problem. We use Rev Trusts not only for probate avoidance and for its death time consequences. We also use it sometimes for lifetime consequences. What might, uh, what might those uh, be? Well, one is, you know, as I get older, I, I might not want to have to manage all my property. So one thing I might do is I might put it all in a rev trust and make you or the bank the trustee. Remember, even under 603, you owe duties to me. Duties still run to the settlor, and that's a kind of nice uh, uh, feature. I, another thing I might do is I might want to keep title uh, clear. You know, I have different assets with multiple marriages and the like. The other thing I might want to be doing is planning for capacity. I might also be using a rev trust to plan for capacity. So what does that, uh, what does that look like? So planning for capacity, here's a line there's, uh, by Duke Minier and this other guy. Right? It's a sad fact of the human uh, condition that a period of mental and physical decay may precede death in old age. Planning for capacity is therefore as much a part of a state planning practice as planning for death. This is an important point that needs to be said again and again and again because it's overlooked too often both in practice and in law reform. Planning for those days, months, years of decrepitude preceding death is as much a part of the estate planning practice as the death plan. Right? It's part of the same portfolio. Use the same instruments in the same conversation at the same time. There's a kind of obvious efficiency. It's using the same tools, same people, same planning. It's all the same story. It's the same reason why trust and states lawyers do premarital agreements. We also need to be doing planning for incapacity. Go back then to our go back then to our, uh, our our plan. We've got two dimensions of planning for capacity. One is for the person. What does that mean? Who's going to make your health care decisions? So this is the famous uh, Terry Schiavo case. Who's going to make your health uh, your health care uh, decisions? Default law everywhere says your spouse, and if not your spouse, then your children. If not your children, then your parents. If not your parents, then your then your um, uh, siblings and so on. Every every time I say that, someone always raises their hands. Well, isn't that a conflict of interest for your spouse? Like, doesn't your spouse? Well, on the one hand, you know, I can keep them alive. On the other hand, I inherit. You know, the answer there is uh, you have deeper problems, right? It seems like the <laughs> this is, you need to be you need to be talking to the family lawyers, right? Wrong department. We're gonna right wrong department for uh, so actually I should say you understand family law. That's just the lifetime side of trust and estates. Right, so their marriage, are two ways out, right? You die or divorce, right? So divorce, that's the family law side. Die, that's our side. So anyway, so back to your plan for incapacity. You plan for uh, plan for incapacity. The other piece of plan for incapacity beside the person is the property. We need someone to be your surrogate decision making, not just for your person, but for your stuff, for your uh, for your property. Well, we have default rules. We have a conservatorship. It used to be guardianship. Now it's conservatorship. Uh, that is a court-appointed conservator with power to administer uh, your uh, property. So this is terrible, right? You want to avoid this at all uh, costs. It's kind of terrible in every conceivable uh, way. First of all, it's terrible because the imposition of a conservator is a deprivation of liberty, right? An imposition of a conservator is a deprivation of liberty that requires due process. And boy, do you get due process if it's going to be a conservatorship. Hearings, I mean, notice and hearings and litigation, it's a nightmare, right? Another way to put this is, you don't want to put your dad through this. It's kind of, and if you're dad, you don't want to go through that. This is a famous Groucho Marx went through this horrible litigation and conservator in a kind of hearing, and it was public, and it was, a, it was a kind of a media circus. Nobody needs uh, this. You don't want this. There's one way. It's, it's horrible on the in, coming in. It's also horrible in day-to-day -day administration. Conservatorship is better than guardianship. You still got to run to court and follow these accountings, get approval for things. It's kind of all the time, right? So those of you know about, say, Britney Spears' conservatorship and whatever, this is what we're trying to avoid. You don't want. You don't want. So how do you get out? One way is the durable power of attorney, 
A durable power of attorney is a power of attorney, a written agency agreement that specifies it survives the, the principal's incapacity. So that's nice. Let's the agent act on your uh, act on your behalf. Here's a little sort of practice tip. When you go show up at the bank with your power of attorney uh, instrument and the bank says that's not our form, we'll take it. You say I need the manager or someone from the general counsel. So they'll take it eventually. It's just the frontline officer has been told we don't want you reading those things. Use our form or not. But they have to take it. You can make them take this. So anyway, so the power of attorney uh, instrument that's kind of nice. You're, so you know it's kind of standard part of the estate plan. Each spouse has a power of attorney for the other and maybe children. And that way someone can sign the checks and pay the bills. It's kind of useful. It's useful. One problem with it is a kind of awkward fiduciary enforcement regime. When the agent, when the principal is incapacitated, it's not obvious how we're going to enforce those fiduciary duties. So lots of articles about how this works, and there's a new Uniform Act. But it's kind of unhappy circumstance to have an agent whose principal is incapacitated without an obvious enforcement mechanism. What would be the enforcement mechanism? We could go to court and get named conservator. So this is a kind of difficult opt-out of conservatorship in this uh, way. The other problem is, of course, it ends when you die. Agency is terminated by death, so that's not going to – another possibility is we could fund a revocable trust. Even if I'm the settlor of the Rev Trust, the Rev Trust – trust law has a trustee successor regime. Even better, the trust instrument will specify. My trust instrument says if my adult children and spouse with the agreement of one treating physician determine that I'm no longer capable of managing my affairs – I'm no longer trustee, and the next successor takes over. That's nice and private. See what it does? It flips it. It makes me object and litigate rather than making my family come in. Do you understand what I've just done? I've done an ex-ante waiver of due process. Another way to think about this is I'm waiving all of that elaborate and horrible due process infrastructure that comes with conservatorship by using the funding of the Rev Trust. Why is it so important to be funded? If it's funded, nothing has changed when I become incapacitated. This is a new trustee, but the property is still titled in the same way. The broker will still take instructions now from the new trustee. The taxes can be paid, instruments signed. Nothing changes. Unbroken fiduciary administration. I'll say that part again. Unbroken fiduciary administration in the revocable trust at incapacity. Another way to put this is I might fund a rev trust because I want to avoid probate. But I also might fund a rev trust because I want incapacity planning. Or I might fund a rev trust because I want both. Uh-oh. See where we're going here? I've become incapacitated. My wife has become the trustee. My wife starts making enormous distributions to herself or her paramour or whatever else. Who has standing to sue her? Do you remember what we just did to the law of revocable trusts? We just said that while I'm while the trust is revocable, the duties of the trust are old exclusively to the settlor. See the tension here? That is the right rule for rev trust as will substitute. That is the wrong rule for rev trust as incapacity planning. Which is this trust? The problem is it could be both. The trust could be both. As originally drafted, Uniform Trust Code, the language that's in blue, that's in brackets, was not in brackets. It said, and the settlor has capacity to revoke the trust. You understand what the drafting committee had in mind. They had exactly the story I'm telling you in mind. They said, well, we've got a will substitute model, and we've got an incapacity. We've got a, a plan for capacity model, and we'll make the trigger the, trust, the incapacity of the settlor. This provision met enormous resistance in enactments. Uh, an overwhelming majority of states that adopted 603 and adopted the code took that language out. So the commission withdrew and put it in brackets. Brackets in a uniform law officially means we don't need to have uniformity on this. Unofficially means we surrender. Please adopt everything else, right? Because you know I'd rather have 80% of my act than none. So please, that's kind of what this, that what's uh, going on here. The explanation given in the process wh when this happened was that this rule is inconsistent with a will substitute uh, model. In other words, when I create the Rev Trust, even if I funded it, I want will rules. I don't want my beneficiaries having any recourse. I don't want them to have information rights. I don't want them accounting rights. I don't want them any rights. I want it to be just like a will. After all, 
If the property were in my name and I had a will, my kids would have no rate rights. They'd have to go bring a conservatorship action. I want the same rule for Rev Trust. That was the argument. The question is, you know, is that right? When my wife is making distributions out of the trust to her paramour or whatever, what's the right way to go? By hypothesis, I'm not going to be able to sue. I'm incapacitated. We could go get the pa person has a power of attorney or I can go get a conservator appointed. And that's the right answer if it's a will substitute purely. But that seems probably not uh, – that seems probably not right. I think maybe I'm trying to opt out of the uh, regime. Oops. Another way to put this is – this is the language from the restatement third of trusts. The matters contemplated here tend to be matters which was – which the trust was the settlor's chosen property management device. And the trustee, rather than a conservator or an agent, was the fiduciary selected for the settlor. What I'm trying to get at here is we had Farkas that said always fiduciary duties. We took that pendulum and we swung it all the way to the other side. We said never fiduciary duties. I think that's not the right rule either. When you fund a rev trust, you must be contemplating that there's going to be fiduciary obligation sooner or later. If not at death, then maybe also when you are, uh, when you are incapacitated. So really the question I'm asking here is what is the right majoritarian default rule? What does the typical settlor want? And I'm going to give you the strong conjecture. The typical settlor wants fiduciary enforcement when we have, when we have uh, incapacity. So what I want to end with is kind of give you a sense of where we currently are and what comes next because that's what the paper is going to be um, about. So where we are is uh, the UTC is a mess. The Uniform Trust Code has been adopted in more than half the country. But this is one of those provisions that has lots of non-uniform changes that has gone in the other uh, direction. The cases, you know, there's some cases that say you do owe a duty to the beneficiaries upon incapacity, but there are some cases that say you don't, and that's because we're going to have variation across the states now, whether we have a will substitute model or uh, not. And what we have instead here, I think, and look how well timed this is, I, what we have here is the last thing I want to say is a kind of example of the new political economy of this field. So it used to be in trust law that you know it was kind of case driven. And then Austin Scott came around, and it became his treatise and restatement driven. And then eventually the Uniform Law Commission got involved, and it became restatement and ULC, uniform law driven. And then the local lawyers and bankers who were enacting these things realized we could enact other things too. And so they repealed the rule against perpetuities and enacted asset protection trusts and kind of whatever else. And so now we have a kind of fragmentation in law reform here, and we have kind of a big mess. I think we have a big mess here. What we have is kind of Farkas again. We are in a highly under-theorized law reform moment where we have this vision of a will substitute model that's completely inapt to a planning for capacity, reflecting an obsession in the field with the will and death and an inattention, right, an inattention that even Jimmy McGill knows you need to have for um, elder law, for planning for incapacity, which is a part of that a portfolio. So I'm right on time. We'll stop there. Thank you. Great.